In this video, I'm going to talk about whether or not the Nikon D7000 overexposes. There's been a lot of online chatter about this, both in the forums and also in some YouTube videos. Um, and a lot of times they'll either not show a, an actual photograph or they'll show a D7000 photograph, won't show a photograph from another camera for that same scene. And without a reference point, it, it's really hard to tell whether or not the, uh, the 7000 just made a bad exposure decision or whether or not the photographer just had unreasonable expectations as to how that scene could have been metered. And so I actually was already in the middle of a full evaluation of the metering systems between the 7000 and the 7D. And so I decided to take a, a break from that and to show you uh, some of my results. So what I have here are a bunch of photographs uh, taken with both the 7000 and the 7D. And for each photograph or set of photographs, it's the same scene. Uh, both cameras had their respective uh, 2470 zoom lenses. So the 7D had the 2470L, and the Nikon had its equivalent 2470 zoom. Uh, both were set to uh, aperture priority mode, and so it was up to the camera to decide the shutter speed as its decision point as to how it calculated exposure for that scene. So before I dive into the pictures, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, methodology that I've applied here. Um, because there's a couple pitfalls I needed to avoid when I was comparing the exposure between the two cameras. Now, I'm using Lightroom for the comparison, and you would think that using the same program for both cameras' images would produce consistent results, but actually the, uh, the opposite is true, because it's not Lightroom's purpose to generate images that look the same across all cameras. It's, its purpose, like many raw processors, is to generate the best possible image for that particular kind of camera. And so what Adobe has done is created uh, unique profiles for each type of camera. And so if you go into the Develop tab here and scroll down to the bottom, you can see the Camera Calibration tab. And I'll go ahead and set this back to the default. Now the default within Lightroom when you first install it for all the images you're going to import is uh, what Adobe calls the Adobe Standard Profile. So that's a profile they think will give you the best possible image uh, across the wide range of cameras they support. Now the thing with this profile is, again, it's calibrated for unique cameras, and so it produces different uh, color and, uh, and uh, exposure biases for different kinds of cameras. And so I noticed right off the bat for the 7D, it was applying a negative exposure bias, and I'll go ahead and demonstrate that here. So I have some snapshots of the same image set up, and so right now the Adobe standard uh, is what the profile you see here for this one snapshot, and then I'll go ahead and switch to the Faithful profile. Now the Faithful profile is uh, Adobe's approximation of what Canon's Faithful profile is. Now that's the profile Canon ships in all their bodies as well as what they make available in their DPP uh, processing tool. And so that's supposed to produce the most neutral Faithful reproduction of the original scene. And so you can see here between these two profiles, all that's changing between the profiles is nothing else. But you can see here there's a color shift which is part of the, the color profile, but also there's an exposure shift. And if you look at the histogram you can see that as well. And so what I've calculated this to be is about a two-tenths of a stop exposure uh, bias for the Adobe standard. So right off the bat, when you import a 7D file, you're getting a two-tenths of a stop uh, a negative bias uh, for the exposure. And so it can make it look like it's actually you know, slightly underexposed when it's really just a bias. And so to normalize and account for this, all the files I've imported for both cameras are set to their respective neutral or faithful uh, profiles to, to minimize or eliminate that exposure bias. Another thing to watch out for when comparing exposure is uh, white balance. So here's a photograph from the D7000. All the photographs I took were with auto white balance enabled for both cameras. And so what I want to demonstrate here is how the white balance can affect the apparent exposure. So I'm sliding the temperature uh, slider here on the white balance. You can see that the colors of the image obviously change, but also the depiction of those colors within the histogram are changing. And so if you have two photographs from two different cameras and the white balances are off by a significant amount, what can look like over or under exposure, particularly in an individual channel, can really just be the difference of the white balance. Now in both cameras, the white balance doesn't really have any effect on the uh, exposure calculations that the cameras make. And so even if the white balance is completely off, for instance, you've set a preset white balance that's just completely wrong, off by you know, even several thousands of degrees, it doesn't really affect the uh, camera's exposure decision. Uh, it'll expose identically regardless. There's totally different domains within the camera's processing. Uh, but what it does affect is, the again, the, uh, the apparent exposure, what appears to be the exposure once you import that photograph into a program like Lightroom. And you can see here that, for instance, if I move the temperature slider back, you can see the, the blue channel uh, uh, creeping up all the way to the right edge of the histogram. And so to normalize for this, uh, for the photographs I'm going to compare in detail, I've normalized the uh, white balance to make them equal, 
and so that there's no exposure difference there. Now, there's a couple other differences. More of them are just technical details, such as nominal ISO differences, meaning you know ISO 100 on the Canon may be slightly off what uh, a Nikon calls their ISO 1000 and the actual luminance or brightness levels. There's also T-stop differences between the lenses. I found that the, the Nikon actually transmits more light through its lens at a given aperture uh, versus the Canon. Uh, but those are all accounted for by the camera since they're all TTL through the lens metering. And so they only really matter when you're comparing identical exposures. For instance, if they both selected identical shutter speeds, one image is going to be slightly brighter than the other just based upon those nominal ISO differences and, and T-stop differences. And so those are really just margins of error really fall within maybe uh, up to a, a third of a stop of difference. And you'll see for, a lot, for the photographs I'm going to examine in detail, that third of a stop really doesn't mean much. Now, one other important factor that I don't want to leave out is how the autofocus point has a significant weighting on the exposure decisions both cameras make. And so there are evaluated metering modes where the camera splits up the entire scene into, into a matrix and evaluates each of those matrices and sort of balances the exposure. Also, pattern matches that scene against its databases of scene. But aside from all that going on and all those calculations, the camera is also applying a heavy weighting toward what you have under your current autofocus point. So to demonstrate that, I have a, a picture here from both cameras with the 7000 image on the left. And in this case, the autofocus point was set to this dock on the lake. And so you can see the exposure decision that the, both cameras made were, were pretty close to each other. They're within a third of a stop. And both cameras, by uh, making this decision, they've completely clipped the sky here. And so they demonstrate that they have a heavy bias toward their autofocus point. And so that's important when I, I took these photographs. I needed to make sure that for both cameras, the autofocus point was under the same subject area within the frame, because if it's off by a little bit, so for instance, if I were to have moved the autofocus point within here, the Snowness Mountain, it would have drastically changed the exposure decision the camera made. And so I was very careful when I was framing these photographs to make sure that the autofocus point for both cameras fell on the same subject area. Now, regarding whether or not that bias is a good idea, it actually sort of makes sense because you typically have your autofocus point on the area of interest within your photograph. And so it's generally an area that you want to have exposed correctly, even at the expense of maybe other parts of the frame. The significance here is, you know, for instance, if you are one of, one of those photographers who do uh, uh, focus and recompose, by recomposing, you're moving the autofocus point away from what your originally intended subject area is, the area that you focused on. And that could have unintended consequences as for how the uh, camera is going to meter that scene. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're using the evaluative mode and doing that focus and uh, recompose.